and C6. Now we've already palpated, I'm sorry, C6 and C7. We've already palpated the Atlanta occipital joints and found out that one of them is high on the left. The left, the Atlanta occipital is high on the left and it's down and posterior on the right. So we know that we've got an adjustment up there. The other manual adjustment or listing adjustment technique that we're going to use is try to see how much range of motion that we have in this horse's neck on either side. Now the horse should be able to bring his nose all the way over and, put and place it real close to the point of the shoulder on both sides. The range of motion should be the same on both sides. Now, um, the horses don't particularly care for this, especially if it hurts them. And so what you want to do is be careful and know what it is, what it is that you're about. You want to do it from either side. What we'll do is we'll grab onto the horse and we'll bring this horse's neck over to the side, like to this. Okay, good. And the motion was compromised, I should say, in that side. Now we're going to try it on the other side and see how much motion we have here. Okay. This horse has about another 5 to 10 degrees more motion on the left side than on the right side. Both times this horse wants to bring this head down instead of turn the head over because I think we have some osteoarthritis in this horse's neck. So that's interesting to note. Now we would have predicted that the horse would have had difficulties bringing the head uh, around straight because of the problems that we're seeing in actually, actually seeing in the neck. Here we go. Now what we're going to do is we'll use the activator device and we can use this device or we can use any other device that we use. And what we'll do is we'll use this activator device and we'll set it all the way up. It's on all the, all on, on the top amount of rings. And we're going to go ahead and fire this. We can also use this uh, with a cervical tip like the ones that we sell, the generic versions. And so this is the, the device that we're going to use. Now a lot of people will suggest that this is not enough motion to move the joints in this horse. And this is not only enough mo uh, motion to move the joints in this horse, but also to, to adjust the PSIS of a draft horse too. Okay. PSIS being back here, and probably some of the most difficult areas to move in uh, the horse as long as the horse is large. This is a small horse and we should not have any difficulties getting reads and also using uh, the, this device alone to adjust this horse at the PSIS. So we'll go ahead and go through an adjustment at the, at the left uh, Atlanta occipital junction and this is what a diagnostic pass in the horse will look like. First of all we take and we fire the device off to make sure that the horse isn't too crazy about it. The horse isn't ha going to have any troubles with this. And then we take and we place the device in the wing of the atlas and we're going to fire it towards the contralateral ear. And of course, as we see, we get an immediate response. Now that is not a response from the sound. That is response because there's a subluxation on board. Okay, you also saw the ear flip back. That is not from the sound. We'll go up underneath on the other side. Now we can go to the other side. We can go to the other side of the horse and do this adjustment, but I prefer to do all the adjustment, if we possibly can, from the left side. Horses are used to being handled from the left side. So what I do is I reach around, find the position, and fire it. Notice we get no read on the right side at all. Okay. Now, in the dog, cat, and other small animals, we'd start going down the neck in this regard, looking for reads, keeping in mind with the neutral ligament and the yellow ligament, there's no way that we can do that. So what we're going to have to do is divide, uh, put motion in and look for mechanoreceptor input reflexive response at the uh, wings or the lateral aspects of the vertebral bodies. Here's the first. As we go down, we can find the second quite quickly. It's right, <laughs> really. it's right here. We'll put motion into this one. And that is not a response. That is basically just a response to the motion. And we find the next one's right here. These masses, these areas in the cervical vertebra basically feel like hard, large lumps, okay? They're not hard to find, especially in an older horse like this. It's, it's hard here, so the motion is placed there. And that was a read, okay? So we find that we have a reading pattern in that regard. Now that's, an, that's a, uh, C2, C3, that was not a read because you don't see reflexive response. We'll go down to 4, no response on 4 or 5. And we do get a re read at five, okay? So five reads. Now six is way the heck in here. And you can palpate it in here, and you get no response at six. What did I say? I had a three, what did it, what was it? Two. Two and four. Five. Two and five, okay. I can't keep track. Now, we found that this horse had difficulties moving the head to the left we'll, or to the right. We'll handle that in a second. But now we're gonna skip these 
completely because the pathology in the caudal neck, in the caudal cervical area, is basically held in place in the feline, I'm sorry, in the equine, in these two ones that we have already found. And now we're going to go back to the lumbar vertebra, I'm sorry, the thoracic vertebra, and adjust those at that location. Now the first one that you're going to be able to palpate is going to be right over the top of T2. Here's T1, we can't get to it. We can fire that until the cows come home and the, and the horse is just going to act startled. When we fire it here, we get the reflexive response. As you see, we get a reflexive response of the whole front left leg. This horse's problem is on the left side. Now keep in mind that the equine is more prone to left-sided problems. Go figure. Animals are more problem, or dogs and cats are more problem to the right side. Remember, the most common subluxation in the canine is the right atlanto-occipital. And in the equine, for some reason, it seems to be the left atlanto-occipital and also anything else on the left side. So this animal has a T2. And also, this is the source of why this animal is so twitchy up in this area. Okay. This is a common problem for an old saddle horse. And we're going to see this horse move at T3, no T4, T5 reads, T6 reads. This is a good horse because for showing this because we're going to have a read all the way on back. And we lose it at around T8. Okay, so T8, it stops. So we'll see what else. We might be able to pick up a mid-thoracic here, too. Okay, and as we're back here at about T12, I'm sorry, we're at about T13, 14, 15. All right, and this is the end. Now, the first lumbar vertebra can be hard to find because you can't really feel what's going on there until you find the rib. And if you find the rib and, and march it up to that vertebra, then you know you're at the first lumbar vertebra. And in so doing, if we fire that off, it's negative. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And now we're up to an area where we'll do the PSIS. Notice that this horse is standing with his weight off his left rear leg. He's standing with his left rear leg just kind of floating, okay? Why is he doing that? He's got pathology in his left sacroiliac on this side. And if we put motion into the right side, I'm at the PSIS, okay? We get a read on the right sacroiliac, or the right PSIS. Now here's the ASIS here, and if we fire that Towards the center aspect, we get no response on the limb that this animal is obviously floating, okay? Floating that limb. We should get a read on that, but we're not getting a read because his problem isn't on that side. He chooses to stand on his right rear leg, but that's also where he's showing pathology. Now keep in mind we have a Lovett Brothers type of phenomenon where we have the left sacroiliac, I'm sorry, the left atlanto-occipital and the right sacroiliac. This is just the exact opposite of what we ordinarily see in the dog. Okay, and that's cleared itself out. Now we're going to come back to the ischial area, and when we're going to finish off adjusting this horse in the ischium, we're going to adjust the horse on the ischial area. We're going to come back, find the spot, and fire it. Now, instead of trying to reach around and do the horse on the other side, although you can do it that way, I choose to go around on the other side of the horse and do the horse from the other side. This is the only real time that I go about doing that. And you probably can't, you can't see that from that side, but that causes a reflexive read of the semimembranosus and semitendinosus muscles on that side. So that's not necessarily a problem. Now, that's the first pass through. We're going to go through the second time and see what it is that we find, okay? And we'll go through, through that real quickly. How's this doing now? Okay, good. So here we go again. And we still have that read on that side. We'll come around over here on the other side. No read on that side. We, we don't do a caudal response like that. We very seldom get any read. Let's go ahead and find the rest of these. Okay. We get a read there at C2. C3 is negative. Oops. C4 gives us a read. C5, nothing. C6, nothing now. We're going to go in deep here. Nothing there. We'll go on the top of T2. Notice that this area now is completely non-responsive. Um, she's just 
responding a little bit too good for this. I don't think that people are going to believe this horse is responding this good. But that's, that's excellent. Notice how the horse has calmed down, too. This horse is very nervous. As soon as we start making adjustments, these horses have calmed right down and allow me to go ahead and do what I need to do. Let's go on the PSIS on the right side. No reaction. On the left side, no reaction. Notice I'm still off of the foot. I'm still off of my foot here. Good girl. Good girl. Now, we'll go ahead and finish it off. And we'll go on the other side. Make sure you always, whenever you move around a horse, that you talk to her or him. And then also, when you move back on the left side like this, he knows what it is that you're, she knows what you're up to. Okay. Now, we'll finish her off uh, with the third pass, just like in any other quadruped. And the chances that we're going to get a read here on the left, uh, left Atlanta is close to 100%. Because this is a chronic read. This has been around for years and years and years on this horse. Why don't you take two? So, as I mentioned before, this horse on the third pass should probably read on the left at Lano Occipital because this is a chronic subluxation. It's been around for at least five to ten years on this horse, or maybe longer. And so we should get a read right here. Um, however, it was significantly reduced. Let's check that again. Yeah. So what we've been able to do is reduce that read in this horse on that side, which is surprising. This is kind of nice. This horse is really cooperating. This is a... This is a barn horse, or this is a backyard horse. We're in somebody's backyard on some on street. This is my brother actually helping me do this. And so we're in the process of doing the rest of this adjustment. Nothing there. Nothing there. Now, let's get in close on this. Good. Okay. So we'll finish off the third, the third pass here. Still has a C2. Four, five, and six are, are, are gone. No problem with four, five, and six. Come back in here. We still get no response. We'll come up on top. seemingly have a problem area right here around five. She didn't like that either. Okay, So this is a problem area at around, it looks like around T5. Okay, We're going back down our system here, looking for reading patterns. Finding none. Locate the PSIS. No response. No response. Right sacroiliac or left sacroiliac. I'm sorry, sit down. Ischial area. And we'll go come around and we'll get the uh, right sac sacroiliac. Okay, good. Now, this horse is adjusted as far as the actual spine is concerned, the axial spine is concerned. And so there are a couple other things that we can do to, to do this. Uh, to, to adjust the rest of this animal's body out. And one of those things might very well be going ahead and adjusting this, this horse's extremities. We'll go over those real quickly. Cut this off just for a second. All right, so now what we're going to do is show you the points on the equine for um, uh, peripheral or extremity adjusting. And this becomes really important for the race horse or just about any horse because they are their legs. The subluxations that occur in this horse are actually basically in the neck on the left side and the left lano-occipital. That's this horse's problem. This other problem that this horse has that takes his weight off of her left rear leg basically resides in the pelvis, and that's why we end up with the reading pattern on the right sacro or PSIS, the right sacral, I'm sorry, the right sacroiliac. And so there is, is the manifestation of the problem. We basically have left side up here, right side back there. And this compromises this horse's gait. This horse is not as bad off, though, as the reading patterns would indicate. Um, these problems will occur further down the line. But we can also show on our little mare here how we're going to go about adjusting this horse's extremities. Now, we can, and you've seen people adjust the, the P, uh, T1, T2, T3 area and also the scapula. And I don't adjust the scapula with the activator device, don't need to. What I will do, though, is I'll go down the scapular spine, which is very easy to find, and find the acromion head and we will fire the acromion head in that fashion. 
Then we're going to find the greater tubercle of the humerus, which is right here, very easy to find. And we're going to fire it towards the contralateral elbow, or on the, on the other side, like that, and get no response. And we're going to go back like that on that area. And then we're going to go down here to the actual elbow itself. Okay, and on the elbow, which is going to be tucked right up against the, ch the chest wall, it's difficult to get to. Here you have a capped elbow problem and a number of other conditions. Control up. Now, in the horse, you want to make sure that you have your body up against the horse when you go down, and you're going to look for the lateral epicondyle of the distal humerus, and you're going to fire it there. You're going to come in underneath the horse on this response and or respect and find the medial epi, um, epicondyle and fire it that way. Then you're also going to fire the olecranon. Notice the way this horse is standing. You're going to fire it down the le length of the olecranon. And that basically adjusts the elbow. And then we're going to come down the leg. We're going to come down the radius. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to adjust the carpus in this fashion. The carpus is adjusted on the radial carpal bone, the ulnar carpal bone are on the other side, and then we do the other carpal bones, click, 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 just like that. Okay, good. Now, as far as adjusting the fetlock, the pastern, and the coffin joints, we leave those alone unless there's an actual problem. You'll find the information in your notes on how to adjust those. We want to palpate the suspensory ligaments, we want to palpate the deep digital flexors, of the foreleg and of the uh, 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 end of the uh, pastern and coffin joints. There you go, coffin bone. She looks like she's a little bit overextended in her pastern, actually. Now we can do that on either leg, but we will only do that on the affected leg. Now she doesn't really have an affected leg. We're just using her as an ex as an example. Now. Let's move back to the uh, rear leg. The rear leg is the most difficult one to adjust as far as the extremity goes, only because if she's firmly standing on the leg, and she's not in this case, standing on this leg, this whole leg can easily be adjusted. The leg can easily be adjusted by um, finding the point. Here's the ASIS. You can fire this one off. And then what we'll do is find the greater trochanter, which is way the heck back here. So we'll fire off that one. And then we'll come down to the stifle. Now notice that she, what she's doing, she's getting all worried about this. This is an area that's not feeling good for her. It's okay, honey. It's okay. okay. And then we'll come on the medial side, like that. Now she does not want me to fool with this leg, obviously. She's crunching down and she's going to allow me. She's been fooled with her whole life and she's pretty much gotten used to it. But what she's going to do now is she's basically trying to guard me from, from fooling around with this leg because it, it hurts. That's why she leaves her weight off of it, which is also why she has pathology on her right rear as opposed to her left rear. This is the one that hurts. The other one's taking all the, the brunt. I'm at the lateral. Here's the femur. I'm at the lateral epicondyle of the femur at this level, and you fire it off in this fashion. You come on the inside, and this is kind of a dangerous place to be, so you want to be careful not to get it too, too deep in here because she will bring her leg forward. And we're going to come down the leg here, and we're going to come down to our tarsal bone. We're going to palpate what, we're got, what we've got going on here with our Achilles, tibial tarsal bone, and we're going to palpate those. And we're going to fire those off in similar fashion as we did before. Tarsal bone, tarsal bone, tarsal bone, and then we're going to come down and address ourselves to the pastern and the coffin joints. Okay, these both seem to be fine at this regard. Um, we can also fire down the length of the fire down the length of the tarsal bone, and that's that finishes off this particular joint. So it's just exactly like it is in the dog. However, the anatomy looks a little bit different. And also, if you'll notice that this horse showed us no reads whatsoever, and you will uh, very commonly not get any reads whatsoever in the equine um, when we do their legs, very commonly, because their subluxations, if you recall, are held in the spinal area, and that's where we get the reflexive reads. Now, if you go through a horse and you don't seemingly think that you get the subluxation reads that you think on the axial spine, that's when you go through and you figure out what's going on with the leg. And in so doing, then, we find out What's going, we clear the leg out, the leg that's compromised, in this case it would be the left rear leg, and then we go back through and see what it is that we have as far as the subluxation phenomenon that has changed the second time over. Okay.
that's a good horse. Okay, that's it. Well, how was that? So that's module three, basically. That's the equine and the feline versions of, of module three, and um, this is the information that is the end of the accreditation period. You're responsible for everything up to this point, including the material that's on the blue tape, and also need to have the VOM pack. If you don't have these things, give me a call, area code 206 523 9917 and I'll get those materials off to you. The questions that are on the accreditation exam will cover all the materials that are available up to this point. Now as I mentioned there is a module 4 which is somatovisceral disease. You can take virtually all the material that we've come to up to this point. You can take all the material and put it in a thimble if you will. Whoops somebody was calling me just now for materials. So I appreciate that. By the way, we do these seminars, and we do them out of my home office here in uh, Seattle, Washington. And so that's why, um, that's why um, the phone usually <laughs> rings when I do this type of work. But nonetheless, Module 4, again, is in fact the somatovisceral disease. And if you were to take all the, t all the information that we had in Module 1, 2, and 3, you put that into a thimble compared to the amount of data that we have available for Module 4. Somatovisceral disease covers disease conditions that heretofore have not even been attempted to be treated in any way, shape, or form in the veterinary medical field. Um, diseases such as uh, uh, hypothyroidism, for instance, can be treated with the VOM technology. The reason that we don't have that and give that information with Modules 1, 2, and 3 is that the sheer volume of somatovisceral disease is such that we really can't even um, touch, touch uh, a little bit of that iceberg um, nonetheless, because of the amount of material that we have to cover. Um, that will be Module 4. Module 5 and Module 6 are other advanced modules, and then, of course, Module 7 is a teaching module. So if you have any more information, I'm sorry, any more questions about that, um, those modules, then just go ahead and give me a call, and I'll let you know when they're going to be available. Throughout the United States, we'll be giving Modules 2, 3, and accreditation examinations in 1998 and 1999 and, and the beginning of 1999 we should see modules 4, 5, and 6 available. Modules 4, 5, and 6 will give us an advanced proficiency rating. So the accredited uh, veterinary chiropractitioner, the CVCP, will also have a level of a higher proficiency. So it would be a proficiency rated CVCP, which may mean nothing more than uh, a person who's just taken a lot more of this information is able to apply it to somatovisceral disease and a number of other problems that we haven't covered in modules one, two, and three. The certification or certified veterinary chiropractitioner's um, certification is basically being looked at very, very carefully by the American Veterinary Medical Association. And um, the important thing there being is that our accreditation is always uh, through veterinary affiliation. Either a veterinarian or a veterinary affiliate is involved with each and every case, which is, I think, why we've gotten so popular and also why this CVCP uh, accreditation seems to be uh, the one that people are, are looking at as possibly a standard for the profession. The profession of veterinary chiropractic we don't like to use. We like to use chiropractitioner, but also what we're dealing with is we're dealing with the practice of the VOM technology. Again, the VOM technology sits squarely in between veterinary medicine and chiropractic care. And if it's occurring on a dog, a cat, a horse, or any other animal, it then becomes uh, a medical procedure theoretically as far as most practice acts are concerned. And the fact there being is that it um, looks to be a, a separate entity unto itself. The VOM technology actually reduces subluxation, which is the bailiwick of the, the chiropractic field, but it does so on animals that have medical problems, which also makes it a medical procedure as far as most practice acts are concerned. And so it actually belongs to neither, and so it exists in that gray area. And we have proven that legally, that that is in fact what it, it, what it occurs. So that's why we have this artificiality of the the certified veterinary chiropractitioner, and basically it allows the powers that be to know that the person that is a CVCP has been trained, and particularly the vet has been trained to work in the modalities of reducing subluxations effectively so as not to step on the toes of chiropractors, and the chiropractors have been trained on the aspects of veterinary medical care pertaining to chiropractic adjustment and VOM technology so they don't step on the uh, veterinarian's toes. And so this is an interesting specialty 
um, or an interesting position to actually sit in between these two professions. And quite frankly, up to this point, it really is starting to become a lot easier and a lot more accepted throughout the United States. People have said, well, that wasn't okay about five years ago. And now they're saying, yeah, well, I guess that's okay. I guess we'll, we'll allow these people to work in this, in this regard. And both the chiropractic and, veter and veterinary fields are basically acknowledging the fact that of the 200 million animals out there, there are half of them, about 100 million animals with subluxations, half, and they all needed adjusting, and they all needed adjusting yesterday. And if nobody does it, they're not going to get treated. So the VOM technology itself and why I have a job and why I have produced this and, and, and done this work is because of one thing and one thing only. If these animals aren't treated, they're either going to be put to sleep or suffer a, an early death or a lot of pain. And so the technique and the VOM uh, technology is developed not so I have something to do or not so I can stand up in front of people and make um, videotapes, but rather to reduce suffering and prolong the life of the animal. And that's what our goal is, to reduce suffering, prolong the life of these animals of which have blessed us with so much love and affection. So that's the end of, of Module 3 and the information that we have. And I, hope, and I hope that you use it to your benefit. And if you have any questions, please call me, area code 206-523-9917. And if you have a clinical case you want me to refer on, we will go ahead and refer those cases if you send me um, materials and x-rays. And it usually costs anywhere from $50 to $100 per case, depending upon how much it is that we have to do. So let me know if you have a problem. And God bless and good night. Hello, and welcome to the VOM Module 3 for accreditation. This will cause um, a person who has taken Modules 1, 2, and 3 to become accredited with this data. There will be information on this video that is part of the accreditation exam. Important to note that the accreditation exam is basically a function of whether or not you've seen the material. In this video, we're going to uh, cover basic diagnostic and uh, adjusting techniques for the feline and for the equine. The amount of material in the notes that you have for Module 3 for the equine and the feline are voluminous, to say the least. This um, video that we're going to show you for the feline and then for the equine only touches a little tiny bit of the amount of adjustments that we can use, in fact, for the cat and the horse. These can also be applied to cattle and other quadrupeds, but the techniques are unique in the cat and the horse. As you'll notice in the notes themselves, there are 
basically tomes and tomes of information. And there's lots more than this where this came from. Now, there is also Module 4, which is somatovisceral disease, which is not part of accreditation. And Module 5, 6, and 7, where 7 is a teaching module, where we actually teach practitioners how to do what it is that I try to do. Hopefully, they'll do a better job than I do on camera. Um, we try to keep the cost of these videos and materials down to a minimum. And um, so we apologize to begin with for the rather homemade nature of, in fact, these videos. But nonetheless, we try to keep the cost of these down. We have found that if we have these done professionally, it increase the cost of the video by approximately $80 to $100 per video, which is we think is prohibitively expensive. So <clears throat> sit back and look at this information, and you will have information uh, or questions on the test uh, for accreditation that will be on this video. Um, and so what we will do is we will uh, give you this information as we go along and we'll just um, show you the techniques for the cat and for the horse. So sit back and we'll see what we can find out. Now it's a beautiful summer day actually, um, August day in September um, in Seattle, Washington. It's a beautiful sunny day outside and I should be outside playing and doing something fun and exciting but I'm going to try to show you how we go about adjusting cats. When we do cats, cats are quite easy to adjust. Almost 90% of what we deal with in cats occurs in the neck. An interesting thing too about kitty cats is that they very seldom show clinical pain. Another point about cats is that their joints will flex to such a, a large extent that when they finally come to tension and you want to adjust them manually, you can sometimes cut off their trachea as a matter of twisting them too far. The point being is that manual adjusting in cats really isn't very effective if we have to take a joint to tension using manual technique. Here, this is why, of course, that we use and apply the activator device because the activator device will always allow the cat to be adjusted. Now, here's another thing, too. If you've got a pissed off little kitty cat, chances are real slender that you're going to be able to adjust them manually because A, they won't cooperate, B, they won't calm down. However, the activator device will always allow these animals to be adjusted, whether they're adjusted on the table holding them down or whether they're adjusted in a cat bag. The kitty cat that you're going to see um, at us adjusting is probably one of the most tractable cats that I have ever come across. Now, I have cats that have acted like little alligators and would tear apart my staff if we didn't hold them out like they were stretch them out and grab them by their scruff, which certainly can be done, but the cat that we're going to show you basically is probably one of the most tractable cats that you'll ever get a chance to see who will just lie there and let me adjust them. Do not assume that this is the way the cats will always be. However, over 80% of the time, the cats will, in fact, respond in this fashion. It's interesting to note as we start to adjust this kitty, the cat starts to calm down, which is something that we see in all the domestic quadrupeds. As soon as we start to make the adjustment, they can be nervous at first, but then they start to calm down. And then at the end of the adjustment, this cat will just about go to sleep. And that's basically one of the things that we see very commonly when we adjust these animals. So keep in mind that some cats and dogs may be um, reluctant to be adjusted at first. And as we start to put motion into their subluxations and reduce them, the endorphins start to release or whatever mechanism is involved there. And we end up with an animal that starts to calm down. Horses will start licking their lips like that. Cats will yawn or fall over and go to sleep and allow us to put them in positions that they ordinarily would not allow us to put them in. Now, when we're going to adjust a kitty cat, we would always like to put a cat on a slippery surface. We do not want to adjust them in the, cat, in the owner's hands or in the owner's arms. However, very, very seldom you may be asked to do that. That is not okay unless you absolutely can adjust the kitty cat any other way. Because what happens when you start holding on to a kitty cat is they will start to get away from you by cl cl climbing up the owner and ripping the owner to shreds, which, of course, is, in fact, your responsibility. A recommendation, then, is always to adjust them on a slippery surface because a slippery surface will allow them no traction and basically they're kind of at your mercy. Another thing about adjusting animals on a slippery surface is that a slippery surface then places them in your in your universe or in your control and they have a tendency to give up. If they've got a good grasp on um, a tabletop or a wooden top or a towel for instance they will struggle to get away. If they know they can't get away they say ah what the heck might as well get adjusted and it makes life a lot easier. So what we intend to do always is always adjust a kitty cat on a formica top or a stainless steel top or something slippery so they can't get a purchase with their claws. Some cats are declawed. Those cats you want to make sure if those cats are aggressive you want to be real careful about adjusting those cats because a declawed cat has only got its teeth 
as a weapon. Very, very, very seldom do we ever have a problem with an animal, even the meanest cats that we can't adjust, um, using this technique, which is why it's so universally used. Also, there is not a joint in the cat that we cannot adjust without the activator device. The reflexive patterns in the cat that you're going to see are quite demonstrable, and because of those reflexive patterns, we're able to find in this reasonably young kitty cat a significant amount of subluxations that we ordinarily wouldn't think to be there. We grabbed a kitty cat that we thought would be reasonably asymptomatic, and we found um, subluxations that were significant in this cat. As we reduce the subluxations in this cat, you can see the endorphin reliefs that gives this cat the, um, the relaxed nature that it has at the end of the uh, adjustment phase. So again, sit back and we'll try to adjust bow tie the kitty cat. We're going to adjust bow tie the kitty cat. Bow tie is a five year old domestic uh, short hair kitty cat, black and white, called bow tie. And we're going to show you how to get bow tie out of the proverbial cage. We're going to use either activator on this kitty cat, and bow tie doesn't have, have any major problems at this point. So we'll show you how we go about doing that, okay? What you're going to do is you're going to use the old classic drag a cat technique out. Trying to pour the cat out of the box is a big mistake because it can screw the kitty cat up. And by the time the kitty cat gets out, they're not having a good day. So about the best way to do is to go in, and they're not going to bite you. Hardly ever will they bite you. <clears throat> you go in and grab their cute little kitty cat scruff neck and then pull them out. Bowtie does not know what he's up to for right now. Now here's Bowtie the kitty. Trying to figure out what the heck's going on. Okay. Now, when we do cats, we do cats basically on the tabletops, and very seldom will they stand up for us. And so when we get a kitty cat out, we'll want to play with the kitty cat. And I always tell, tell everyone that they, they can adjust the cat usually from the right side. We're going to try to adjust uh, bow tie from the left side because most of the work that we've done in the VM technique has been from the left side. So we use that as a reference point. But as you can see right now, bow tie is trying to turn around to the right side. Cats have a tendency to want to be adjusted from the right side. He's getting used to his environment because he's just taking a trip across the town. He's a pretty nice, mellow little kitty cat. Should be relatively easy for us to adjust. Um, your holder is going to basically hold on to the kitty cat in this fashion, usually stabilizing the head and shoulders. And cats are rarely a problem for, for control. However, if the cat is going to give you some grief, what's going to happen with this kitty cat is you're going to have to probably grab a hold of the scruff of the neck. It is not wise to elevate the cat up unless you support the cat by the rump. And there is a technique that people will use called a stretch a cat technique. Now, boy, I'm sorry to do this to you, but we have to show the folks home at home. And that's when a cat's scruff is grabbed like this, and a cat is pulled out extremely hard like this. This cat cannot be adjusted. Do not do that to this kitty. If a cat needs to have that kind of restraint, then put the cat in a cat box or a cat sack or in a uh, fishing net. We use a lot of salmon nets in the Pacific uh, Northwest to, uh, uh, to wrap cats up because we can't use them for salmon because there ain't no damn salmon in that ocean. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to go through and show the major uh, uh, points of interest here with this kitty cat as far as adjusting technique is concerned. One of the things that you'll first do with a kitty cat is, is check out the cat's ordinarily, ordinary demeanor. And this kitty is pretty nice and calm. We're going to want to feel the wings of the atlas. And you can feel them on the cat relatively easily by palpating the wings right here. They're smaller than in the horse, of course, and relative to their size. And also much smaller relative to the dog, relative to its size, too. And in this kitty cat's case, you can actually palpate that the wing of the right atlas, this atlas, is down. This one is down on the right side, which is of interest, too. Keep in mind that 90% of all the problems and subluxations that we see in the feline actually do, in fact, occur in the occipital area right here. So this is about 90% of the whole ball game, if you will. So we will adjust this kitty cat in classic fashion. Now, people have asked me whether or not they increase their or decrease their, the rings on their activator device. And frankly, it, it's unique for each and every cat. A lot of people suggest that they can take the springs out of the end of the generic activator device that we provide. And in so doing, as you unscrew this, this is the device I provide in my seminars. And you can take this device out, take it apart, take one of the springs out, and put it back together again, and making it uh, a less of a pulse, actually, and easier to adjust the cat so the cat is not startled. Now, half the time this is effective, half the time it doesn't really make a difference, okay? So all we're trying to do is provide enough motion in to the um, 
dorsal spinous horn, in other words, so we can make an adjustment pulse. We'll use this Activator 2 device with an integrated cervical tip because it has the rubber pieces on it and I like to hold it and I'm just used to using it. And also you can see it a little bit better as to where we're going to take it. Notice that we do not change the tip itself. We do not take this tip off and put a smaller one on or in some cases people will take the tip off itself and adjust with just the end of the mallet. Big mistake. The, and it's analogous to, in fact, um, taking a high heel shoe versus a great big fat clog type shoe because as you decrease the force over the surface area, you increase the, the um, strength extremely high. And so leave the device exactly the way it's set. This one is set now on about a ring and a half. And what we're going to do is try to contact this kitty cat's left atlanto-occipital junction at the wing of the atlas. That position is going to be approximately here. And so we make the motion and we see no response. We're going to look for the same types of responses that we in fact do see in the, in the canine <coughs> and in the equine. Now, we want to get the head straight. Notice that we've, no, we've palpated, which is very unusual to palpate in a cat, that the right wing of the atlas is down on the right side. And we see, boom, we obviously have a motion. We'll hold on for one second. Now, as you saw, we got a read on the right atlanto-occipital area. This is a very common read for the canine, not a very common read necessarily in the feline because they do not have the predilection to be jerked by their neck on a collar. This cat actually is led around on a collar on a routine basis, I happen to know. So the left atlanto-occipital area did not read. The right did read. You could palpate that listing, which is kind of uncommon. We'll come back in the center and look over there. It's a, it's a mouse, some cheese, some food. And of course, this cat reads in the center, too. So the cat reads on the right side and the left side. Notice this cat's all of a sudden becoming nervous. We're starting to move these vertebral segments around, and in so doing, we're releasing these reflexive patterns, and these reflexive patterns are not normal for this cat. These subluxations have occurred for a long period of time, and now as we release them, they make the cat feel, for lack of a better word, kind of funky, if not strange. If you ever had an adjustment yourself, it actually does make you feel quite, quite strange or maybe kind of spaced out as, as this occurs. You'll notice that this cat, or other cats, and horses particularly, will calm down as you continue the adjustment. I'm not suggesting this cat's going to get any more calmer than this cat already is, because bow tie is pretty mellowed out, as you can tell. Now we'll go through the cervical vertebra. I'll have my wife, Wendy hold the air straight and we'll go through this cat forward this way. Click. We get a read on two, I'm sorry, three, four, five is uncomfortable, six where it reads. And we're going to come back in between the shoulder blades and this placid little kitty cat basically has read throughout the neck. This is a very reactive kitty cat. And not reactive because the cat is just nervous, but rather this cat's reactive because there's subluxation that occurs at the right atlanto-occipital area. Now we're always talking about getting reads and relying on reading patterns as opposed to listings. This kitty cat had, if you had L, uh, intelligent fingers, of which I don't pretend to have, but, th but you could tell that there was a listing on this side at the right atlanto-occipital area. And of course that predisposes all the reads that we have down the neck. Now even if we could not feel those through palpation, we could have very easily have found them with the activator device. Now we'll go in between the shoulder blades on our little kitty and we'll go down into the thoracic. The thoracic cavity in the cat you think would be replete with subluxations. Uh, what we see in the cat in the thoracic cavity is not necessarily that big of a problem. Here we have the last rib where my thumb is and we're about T8 or T10, 11, 12, 13. As you see there's no reading patterns there. The area, the other problem area in the cat is from about T13 on to about L45, and that area is the area that is predisposed to the cat's hyperesthesia uh, syndrome, or what we call the feline spinal, uh, skin spinal reflex phenomenon. And that will cause sometimes a cat to reflexively start licking and slurping, or and, and, and licking away at its left or right shoulder, or licking the air, or the cat will sometimes whip around and growl at you or act like you really hurt it. But basically that's this area right across the back. Here's another interesting thing too. In cats that are hyperesthetic, you can take your hand, you can bring it down the back of the cat without touching the cat, flexing the hand 
against itself, making your hand rigid over the back, and you will cause this catty, kitty cat's back to wince. When you see that kind of behavior, you know that there is, in fact, a serious amount of subluxation that occurs in the lower back area. And you might also think that you're a little bit magic. What's happen happening, actually, is the stress of your hand and the biomagnetics of the back, basically, are, are interpinging themselves on one another and firing off that reflex. Here we have the area of the last rib making this L1, and so we'll fire L1, and as you see, L1 obviously reads. Now, T13 did not read, L1 does read, and so this kitty cat obviously has a subluxation at L1, so we'll see what happens at L2. L2 is negative, 3 is negative, the ears are twitching, we're not going to get too excited about that back here, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now, we're going to go ahead and try to find, and in the cat, we can easily find the wings of the atlas. I'm sorry, the wings of the ilium, of the sacroiliac. Here's the ilium, here's the ilium. We can easily put our fingers on the wings of the ilium. And so we'll put a pulse into the left ilium. Notice it caused the cat to jerk all the way up. Here is the left ilium responding two that is the Levitt brother of the right atlanto-occipital subluxation. We could have predicted that there was going to be a read in this pair in this area. And very commonly on the other side, you'll see that there's also some reads too, because the pelvis itself cannot just subluxate on one side. It has to, like it fractures, it has to fracture and subluxate in sometimes two different locations. Although we'll sometimes very often put them both in place when we make the original adjustment. Notice it does not read now. When we go on to the other side, it also doesn't read. This cat's pelvis has been adjusted with the diagnostic pass. So this kitty cat is, even though this cat is normal, happy, healthy, five-year-old kitty cat, which, by the way, lives with a 105-pound uh, Dalmatian that's probably got only one neuron. That's run and mash the cat and then get up and go and do it again. But what we have is a cat that's basically beat up by the, and plays with this great big uh, Dalmatian every day and the chances that this cat's going to have some subluxations are real high. Now, that was pass one. We're going to put the cat straight. Notice that we can adjust this cat while the cat is lying down. Also, we can adjust the cat while the cat is anesthetized, lying on its back. We've talked about anesthesia and, and kitty cat uh, adjusting in module two and also in this module. And also, we can adjust the cat off skew or even twisted with the spine because they don't have to line themselves up. Now, they do have to line themselves up perfectly, when we try to adjust and evaluate them with manual adjusting, that's why we try to get away from manual adjusting using the activator device because, quite frankly, um, any other technique is kind of a waste of time, particularly in cats. Um, one of the other problems with manual adjusting in cats, and this is not meant to be a criticism, but if we were going to take this right atlanto-occipital subluxation, which we can find with a listing, and by the way, it palpates completely straight now, if we were going to take and try to adjust it manually, this would be a good cat as uh, a subject to do it because this cat is very tractable. The cat that's trying to rip your nose off, the kitty cat that's trying to give you an attitude, basically that cat is going to be almost impossible to adjust, but this is a, a cat from heaven. However, if we were going to adjust this cat, we would take this cat's head up, put it down, we would twist it to we, where we put this cat's head in, in our, or its joint. We take the laxity out of the joint which is further than this, further than this, further than this, further than this. And if I go any further, I'm going to compromise this poor little kitty cat's trachea and the cat won't be able to breathe. But if I went about another 10 degrees, then I would make a real quick pop, and theoretically that would put this cat's neck back in place. However, once this cat's head goes past this point here, we've collapsed the trachea. Cats don't like that. I don't like that. So that's one of the reasons, too, that we don't do this. Now. We're going to go through the kitty cat one more time in what we would call our first therapeutic pass. By the way, the activator device was turned in this cat all the way down to no rings whatsoever. So we'll see what we have on the left side. And now what we have a cat is a cat is going, wow, what was that? That was not a reactive read, but rather the kitty cat's ears pulling back and the cat's head coming back because this kitty cat is not too crazy about being adjusted right now and a little bit nervous about what I'm going to do over on this side. And you can see the cat has still got an active reading pattern on that right side. Not a good thing. This kitty will probably read right here. And we would count that as a read. Now we're going to go through the neck of this cat. We're going to keep the kitty cat straight. The neck is clearing itself out quite nicely. 
And as we come down the back of the kitty, we've got a, a reed here at C7. As we come back down the cat, I'm trying to make sure we're going to pick up some, let's see, we've got to pick up a reed here. And that puts us at about T10, 11, 12, nothing at 12, 13. Now we got a read, nasty read at L1, which is right here. Put it on the dorsal spinous process end. We also still have a bit of a read that's going on there. Now, as we move further back to the back, we're going to come back and we're going to see whether or not we still have a reading pattern over the left sacroiliac. Now that one's gone. The right one is gone. So here again, now it looks like our kitty cat's problem area is going to be up in the neck still. We're going to go through a third pass on this kitty and determine what else we have left. On the left side, we get almost no read. On the right side, we're very possibly we're going to get a read again because this is a chronic subluxation. That, this is where this cat's problem is. Notice how anxious our little kitty is of getting adjusted in this area. Okay, so this cat is still reading. I'm not going to fool with this anymore. I'm going to go in between the two. Now, I've got my hands. My hands are on the wings of both atlases. And I'm going to place them in that position. I'm going to go right between the crux of my thumb and forefinger. and fire it in that condition. We're going to go back then and do four, five, six. The ear flipping basically is nothing that we're going to get too worried about because it looks like we've calmed it down. This device is turned, like I say, all the way down. And as we move back here, what's going on here? This is, C this is L7. Seven. And left sacroiliac, which reacted first. The right one doesn't read. This kitty cat's adjusted. This is a cat that could potentially be sore the next day, um, if not this evening. Now, the problem with that is that cats rarely show soreness. They basically just start purring and they do really well. But the problem with this cat also could be that if we tell the client, we should always tell the client that the owners, that, that these cats may be sore, but if in fact they did, that's the situation, do not, repeat, do not give this cat any aspirin or aspirin substitutes because it'll kill old bull tie dinner and a doornail. So what we'll want to do, that's not exactly true, but if you continue to give it, um, they don't have the transport mechanisms that can allow them to get rid of it, so they'll accumulate a toxic dose inside of a couple days, and then they'll end up with acute renal shutdown. Let's turn a bow tie over on our side, his side. Hi, Bo. Oh, wow. Now what we're going to do now is we're going to set bow tie up for an extremity adjusting. If you're presented with a kitty cat that shows no adequate read on the first pass but is lame or limping or favoring a leg, this is what you should do. You make the first pass, you know the animal's favoring on the leg so there should be some luxation. So what you then do is you go ahead and you adjust out that limb. If it's a left front or the right rear, you go ahead and adjust the limb that's being favored. You should be able to determine how the leg is being favored by watching the animal move. If, in fact, you don't know which one's going on, my advice would be then to check all four limbs out. We're going to adjust this cat peripherally in the extremities as delineated in small animal module two. However, we're going to apply it in Module 3, and we'll show you how you go about um, doing it in the same fashion. By the way, extremity adjusting is the same for all quadrupeds, and in this cat it's going to be the same um, as we apply it to the horse or to the dog. However, it looks a little bit different only because of the different um, relative anatomy of the cat versus the horse or the dog. We'll start in the thoracic limb, and we're going to try to adjust this. So let's say that bow tie presented with obviously not breathing. Oh, definitely breathing. Um, bow tie presented um, to our, our practice with favoring the left front leg. We check the whole leg out for abscess and bite wound. We can't find anything wrong with that leg. We may have even x-rayed it and can't find anything on x-ray, yet this kitty cat is favoring the left foreleg. We go through the cat and we don't find what we think to be significant subluxation patterns, which of course would be for the foreleg would be C5, 6, and 7. By the way, this kitty cat did show us C5, 6s, and 7s, and so this cat's neck was out because the right lenoccipital area was out. But nonetheless, let's, our, our, let's pretend that bow tie was favoring that left rear leg. So after the first pass, we would go ahead and try to clear with the device 
we would try to clear out the leg. We would take the device and put it at one to two rings, and then we would go ahead and contact these points. We're zooming in now a little bit, just to so show you a little bit better what the topography of this little kitty cat's going. So we have a compromised foreleg. Now Bo can have this done on lying down on its side. We're going to find the wing. I'm sorry, the acro I'm sorry, the acromion head, which is right here. A little bit different in the, in the feline as far as the anatomy is concerned, but it's where we would expect it to be. It's at the end of the scapular spine. So we find the scapular spine, the supra and infra, uh, spinatus muscles, and then we go right over the top of it and fire it off. If you do not find a reed, very, very commonly in extremity adjusting, you will not find a reed. So we fire it here. Okay. That is the shoulder adjustment. Then we're going to go ahead, we'll put Bo's head forward, We'll find the proximal aspect of the greater tubercle of the, the greater tubercle of the humerus, and we're going to fire it caudally. Click as it fires caudally, and then the lateral aspect of that proximal humerus, and we'll fire it towards the contralateral elbow right here. So we would fire it down towards there, and then we're going to go down, and we're going to do the elbow. You do not have to have the cat lying on its side to do this. So we're going to do the elbow. And in doing the elbow, we're going to do the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Click. We're going to do the medial epicondyle of the humerus. And notice we're actually getting responses on this. The medial epicondyle here missed. There. And we're also going to go after the olecranon, he's starting to purr, and that reads down the length of that. Then we're going to do the radial head on the lateral side of this kitty cat. We're palpating the radius here. On the lateral side, we'll fire that off. Notice that also reads. Then we're going to come down and we're going to adjust the carpus, but before we do the carpus, we're going to adjust the lateral malia, I'm sorry, the lateral aspect of the radius, the me, I'm sorry, the ulna, the medial aspect of the radius, and then we're going to come across the carpus. Notice that we're going to take the carpus here and here, and as a matter of fact, this kitty cat's radial and ulnar carpal bone are probably going to be identical as far as the same pulse because the width of the device will extend over both areas. And then if we need to, we can adjust the metac metacarpal bones as need be. However, very commonly, the way that we can adjust the digit is to put traction on it, lift it, and pop it down in place. Traction, and you grab it with both fingers. Traction on the digit, stabilizing the joint above. Pull it up, and put it down in place. And commonly, you'll hear a little pop if you've got a subluxation in that area. Um, it is very uncommon for cats to dislocate or compromise uh, or subluxate their digits. Now, that involves the foreleg. The rear leg is a different matter altogether. Let's shove Bo a little bit further forward. What we want to try to find is the wing of the atlas and the ischial area. By the way, on the previous adjustments, we avoided, um, we left out adjusting the ischium on one side and the ischium on the other side. And those should also be kept in, in play when you're doing a complete workup. And so here you have the actual ischium and the ilium. And now we're looking for the head of the femur and the drater trochanter. We found the head of the femur at this point, And what we're going to do is we're going to fire it at the greater trochanter towards the contralateral knee. Okay? And so we fire it there. And then we're going to come back on the head of the femur I'm sorry, at the head of the femur, at the drater trochanter, and fire it backwards. Okay, there was no read there. That was just motion from the device. Then we'll extend the leg a little bit and come down, and we'll get the knee. And the knee, we're going to feel the lateral aspect of the distal ep um, epicondyle of the femur. Fire it on the left side, and then we're going to come around. We're going to fire it on the right side, on the medial side. And then we're going... To, to actually fire it right classically on the straight patellar tendon, which is going to be right here. And very commonly, well, it didn't do it in this kitty cat, but very commonly what that'll do is cause a straight patellar reflexive pattern. Okay, didn't read. Then the last way we're going to treat is we're going to find that patella, which is right here. We're going to hook on the end of that patella and fire it 
down the length of the leg. There's nothing wrong with this kitty cat's left rear leg. Keep in mind the left, right sacroiliac's already been adjusted. And then when we come down the length of this cat's leg, we go ahead and we palpate the lateral malleolus, and we find the lateral malleolus, we fire it there, we come underneath and palpate the, and, and fire the medial malleolus, and then we go ahead and go after the tuber calcaneus, firing it down the length of the tuber calcaneus, and then that puts us down in the tarsus. We can fire on the tops of the tarsal bones, and then we can adjust the metatarsals and the distal tarsals as we need. And then we can also adjust, we can also adjust the um, phalanges. Now, when we were kids, we probably spent a lot of time trying to adjust uh, inadvertently the kitty cat's tails. And a tail of a cat can be adjusted. They commonly get screwed up. Now, don't do this. Don't make this mistake. Don't try to adjust a cat's tail who has been basically at a, at a 90 degree angle for about seven years because that cat's tail is not going to adjust. What you can do is you can put traction on the tail, stabilize the uphill piece or the, up, the proximal piece, traction on the tail, lift it up, traction more, and pull it down. Lift it up, traction more, and pull it down. You can't just jerk on this cat's tail. It's not going to solve the problem. Although, a lot of times that might be the situation. However, what you have to do is stabilize the joint above, traction, lift, traction, push down like real quickly. Now, this can be done, too, with the activator device. What you have to do is stabilize that piece and, put, and have somebody else pull traction on it and then push it down with the activator device. That can be done. However, it takes two people to actually do that, and it sometimes can be easier to adjust this cat manually. So now, as a review, these are the positions and how we go about taking care of this kitty cat's adjustments. These are the places that we'll hit each and every time when we adjust the cat axially. We just showed you how you adjust the cat extremity-wise, but these are the axial adjustments. Now, with the cat's head forward, the device is placed at the wing of the atlas and fired towards the contralateral ear, towards the contralateral ear like that. And then we go around on the other side and fire it exactly oppositely. Then we come and put our hands in between the two areas of the wings of the atlas. And what I do is I take the device and I lay it in, in between the two fingers because I know exactly where the center of it is, right there, and fire it there. That's two, three, four, five, six. And then you can palpate the shoulder blades. My finger can be buried that far into the shoulder blades of this kitty cat to get six, seven, and eight. Okay, so here is six, here is seven, here is eight. And sometimes we may want to, we're really worried about eight, we'll go all the way back to there. Then we'll go T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, seven, eight, nine, oops, seven, ten rather, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, oops, my fingers in the way. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And here is L1. L2, L3, L4, 5. This is an interesting area here. 6, 7. The wings of the ilium are here and here. And they're fired straight up and down too. Click, click. And the, ischi uh, the, the ischial bones can be easily palpated here and fired forward on this kitty cat at this point and on this point. Okay, good. Now, in review, the points in the cat's um, uh, extremities is the acromion head, which is here. Let's keep it in some. Acromion head. Oh, you're a poor cat. The humerus. The greater trochanter of the humerus on that side, the, the greater trochanter of the, I'm sorry, the greater tubercle of the humerus directed towards the uh, contralateral elbow. As we go down to the uh, distal aspect of the humerus, we're trying to get to the uh, epicondyle of the humerus on the lateral side, on the medial side, and then when you do it on the medial side, be careful not to nail their crazy bone. 
In other words, your ulnar nerve is right here. So you don't want to hit that. You want to, you want to miss that. You can feel the nerve right here, and you can feel the epicondyle right here. So you want to get just to the distal to that so you don't hit it. And then you go ahead and get them at the uh, 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 end of the olecranon, and then you're going to go down, and you're going to fire on the radial carpal bone and the ulnar carpal bone and any other carpal bones that you think are worthwhile. Um, and then we'll go back to the kitty cat's uh, rear leg where we can find the greater trochanter of the femur, and we're going to fire it towards the contralateral knee, like that. And then we're also going to come back from anterior to posterior in this regard and, and fire it back in that regard. And then we're going to go to the distal epicondyle of the lateral epicondyle of the femur. We're going to do the same thing on the inside. And then we're going to go right onto the straight patellar tendon. And the dog, this will almost always give you a reflexive knee jerk response. And the cat, it may or may not happen. And then we're going to hook the patella and go down the length. Oops, sorry, honey. I'm getting hot, Mom. And go down the length like that. And then we're going to do the lateral aspect of the femur. I'm sorry, the lateral aspect of the, of the hawk by firing the lateral malleolus, the medial malleolus, down the length of the tuber calcaneus, and any tarsal bones that we think that we need to adjust. So those are the spots that we see in the cat and how we go about making an adjustment um, extremity-wise and axial-wise. Axial and this will theoretically give us a healing solution pattern. Equine adjusting is a lot easier than it appears. One of the daunting problems with the equine is that we think that perhaps because the horse is so big that the joints will not move with the device itself. The device delivers anywhere from 27.7 pounds of, of uh, force and that is actually more than we can produce with our hands um, in lots of locations. There are, very, there are very few joints in the horse that cannot be adjusted and I'll direct ourselves to those in a few seconds. However, one of the things that is important to note is the activator device has been used across the country for adjusting horses. There are virtually tens of thousands of activator practitioners in the United States, and the device has actually been used um, by those practitioners, not knowing what they were doing, to adjust horses for the last 10 years. Um, of the people, of the 2,700 people that we taught Module 1 materials with, which had nothing to do with horses, there were close to 500 practitioners that we know out there that are applying the activator device to the horse without having taken this module. In other words, they were just applying the basic adjusting technology of the cat and the dog, in this case the dog, to the horse, looking for diagnostic reads and reducing those subluxations, and then standing back and looking and seeing how the horse improved. The horse improved very dramatically. Some horses who can't even perform after adjusting will perform within a matter of minutes. I'm talking about barrel racing horses, I'm talking about race horses, I'm talking about dressage horses, horses that are having troubles with flying changes of leads, also horses that have lamenesses of acute, especially, and chronic nature. We also have a number of other things that we can t treat uh, uh, in a chronic nature. We can treat in the horse that we can't treat with any other technique, and that information is actually delineated quite well in your notes, and I refer you to that at this point. Back again now to the physics of the device. The device itself is held in the hand in two different fashions. It's held straight on or it's held hooked over. You have some plates in your notes showing how we go about doing that. Um, you'll also see in the upcoming information how it is that we hold on to, to the device in the horse. The only tricky part in adjusting the horse can sometimes be the huge horse, not like the horse that we're going to see, but the posterior, superior, iliac spine on either side can be difficult to adjust in a draft horse, a draft horse uh, over 1,500 pounds. And that horse can be adjusted when the leg is lifted up off of the ground or, and also pulled back to where the femur is perpendicular to the ground. That almost always allows us to adjust with the activator device. So that is a limitation of the activator device in only the huge horses. But now here's the bad news. The bad news is, is we can't get the activator device adequately to C6, C7, and C8. And to do that, to adjust those areas, we have to adjust manually. And we show you those techniques as uh, upcoming in um, this video. The manual adjusting techniques require having to pull the horse's head over to the point of its shoulder to determine range of motion. Range of motion compromisation is a listing, not a read. 
Range of motion compromisation is one of the only ways we can evaluate C6, C7, and C8. They are important. However, it's a good thing that they're not commonly screwed up. Very commonly, the middle cervical vertebral segments in the horse will have subluxations and will have compromisation with them, and the caudal cervical ones won't, which is kind of nice. We'll see lots of reads in the mid-cervical area around C3, C4, and C5, where we don't see them in the cat or in the dog. Okay? Keep in mind the cat's problem is almost always anterior cervical. The horse's problem is mid-cervical and also anterior thoracic. Also at the end or at, at T17 uh, and 18 and the mid lumbar area and of course over the posterior superior iliac spine. Not to mention of course the extremity adjusting. In both the cat and the dog we're going to, we have shown you in the cat and we're going to show you in the dog, how, I'm sorry, in the horse rather, how we go ahead and adjust the extremities. In an animal that we think that is lame, we will do an axial pass, the first pass, then we will clear out the extremity using extremity technique, and then do another axial pass and a final axial pass before we actually, before we actually call the animal as adjusted. Now, in working with horses, they can be somewhat unpredictable. Manual adjusting with horses can be taking your life into your own hands if you're unsure of what you know what you're doing. Now, people on horse, men and horse women, are very sure around animals, around the horses, and the horses know this. And if you're unsure about working with horses, you should make sure you get comfortable with working around horses and make sure that they know that you are comfortable working around them because they sense your uncomfortableness and they respond to it. Also, you do not want to make a lot of rapid motions around the equine, and you want to always approach equine, of course, from the left side. Almost all of our adjusting is done from the left side, save the adjusting that we're going to do on the right caudal cervical area and the right ischial area. In that case, what we do is we adjust the left side of the horse, then walk around and adjust the right side of the horse in those two positions. So for all intents and purposes, we spend most of our time on the left side of the horse. One of the things that you should keep in mind, too, if you're a neophyte horse person, is that if you're working with the rear leg, it is wise to lean up against the rear leg. Because if you stand about two or three feet away from the rear leg, that's just the perfect amount of distance that the horse needs to accelerate that rear leg so he can break your hip. If you're laying up against his leg, he just throws you into the paddock and you fall down and look ridiculous and you say to yourself, gee, Dr. Bill was right. So this is an important thing to do for safety. Also, if you feel uncomfortable about adjusting a horse, don't adjust the horse, okay? If the horse is trying to kick the snot out of you, then go on to the next horse. Most horses will allow you easily to adjust them. And once you start to adjust them and start to reduce subluxations, they will show a number of calming effects. Their ears will come back up. Their body will kind of slump down. They'll look relaxed. They'll, switch, they'll shift weight. Their fasciculations, especially in the thoracic cavity, will stop, if not slow down. And they will also start, when, they, when we start reducing subluxations, for some reason, they'll start licking or chomping or chewing their cud like that, making a ridiculous sound. You may be back at the back end of the horse making an adjustment back there and all of a sudden the horse decides to chew its cud. So here is um, uh, a means by which we can go ahead and adjust the horse in almost every case, if not every case, without harming ourselves or without harming the horse and be assured that we're reducing the subluxations that are on board. Another very important factor is that a lot of the subluxations, especially in the thoracic cavity, anterior thoracic cavity, and the anterior lumbar area, will not show up as listings at all. And because they won't show up, they basically then do not get adjusted. However, the activator device will fire them off, will fire off paniculus reflexes and other reflexes that are so demonstrable they're hard pressed to miss. One of the nice things about the equine is that since everything is increased in size, Everything is easier to find in most cases, and then also all the reflexive patterns can be quite exaggerated, a lot more than in the cat or in the dog. So we're not dealing with a subtle situation here. This is pretty obvious that the animal has a problem. Again, if we have an animal that is lame in one leg or other legs, or, or two legs, we want to clear that leg out after we have done the original axial pass to find out what's going on, and then do another axial pass after those leg or legs has been cleared out using the extremity technique, and determine and compare that second axial pass from the first axial pass, I guarantee you it will change. Sometimes you'll find nothing on a lame animal, you'll find no reading patterns whatsoever. None. 
and then you clear out the leg that's obviously lame, or maybe we've got a, a bone or box spavin or something going on with the suspensory ligament. We clear that leg out, and then all of a sudden we have reading patterns all up and down the back. One other note, too, an animal that's on heavy medications, especially butazolidin, may show no clinical symptomology at all in that case, or reads rather, in that case, the lame animal should be adjusted in its extremities and should be adjusted in where we would suspect the animal to have reading patterns. The, do the horse may show no uh, reading patterns whatsoever, but we'll adjust them in those lo locations anywhere. For, anyway, for information about where those locations are for the specific disease conditions, I'll refer you to the notes, um, Module 3, VOM Module 3, and the equine section. Now, in going ahead and, and making the adjustment in the equine, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have a quiet and easy place. You have somebody holding on to the front of the horse because the horse is only going to go there. If it's going to be the owner, make sure that they can control their pet. You do not want to adjust an animal in a stanchion. You do not want to adjust the animal in a stall at a point where you can get hurt. You do not want the animal to be able to spin around wildly in the middle of a yard either. So you want to have usually two people helping you uh, make a horse adjustment. If you only have one, make sure the horse is going to hold still for you. And if you have to sweet talk that horse, then go, go ahead and do that. Sweet talk the horse until the horse gets used to the fact that you're going to be use the, using the activator. I have adjusted some of the meanest and the rankest uh, stallions that have been out there who would just as soon kick, kick me and kill me as look at me. And after I've adjusted them a couple times, especially in the neck, they would allow me to go ahead and adjust them anywhere in the body, including the ischial area, which sometimes makes them nervous back there. So um, just make sure that you approach uh, the horse with respect and with confidence, and you should not have any difficulties. Here again, equine adjusting is some of the easiest adjusting that we'll, we'll do. It doesn't look like much to the client, but it produces huge effects in these very large quadrupeds. So good luck, and sit back, and we'll look and see what this, what this looks like. Sir, what's our gender of horse? We've got a little mare, huh? And um, we're going to go ahead and see what's wrong with this. This horse is about 17, 17 years of age, an older horse, a number of problems possibly. And we're just going to show some, some basic workups on how we go ahead and make an adjustment on your basic horse. One of the things that we want to do is to evaluate how this horse moves. And we'll want to um, just generally check out the horse. And you'll notice that his front two feet are standing like this, which is not OK. And also, this horse has a tendency to put the weight on the front right leg all the time. Um, we've got a little bit of scoliosis. When you look down the back of the neck of this horse, this horse is pretty tractable. When you look down the back of the neck of this horse, it looks like the Ventura Freeway, for crying out loud. Um, this horse is compensating in a number of ways. And also, if you were to look down the back top of, of this horse, you would find that the croup on the left side is down. Now, here's an interesting point. A horse that is having difficulties or a lameness is going to drop the croup on the affected side and it's going to dip the head on the affected side. So you always keep that, or I'm sorry, the head comes up on the affected side. And so if we walk this horse and the horse bobs its head, the horse will bob its head up on the affected side, usually the left front. Come on, let's take a walk. Come on. They want to walk in, him in tight circles and see how he manages to walk in tight circles. Now when you do this, you want to make sure you don't get stepped on. And he doesn't seemingly have any trouble going this direction. You take him back the other direction, and this is when you get stepped on. Okay. And as he crosses over, he's does a pretty he does a pretty good job. Okay. Good. Now we're gonna back him up a bit. there. We're going to bring him forward before he tries to bite me. Stop. And we're going to spin him back around. He wants that grass. And then I'm going to jog him a little bit. And we're going to want to watch, want to watch him walk or, or jog a little bit. So come on. Come on.
A horse that'll cross over like this. He goes front, behind, front, behind. Looks like he's doing pretty good. Now, next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to try to evaluate his lano occipital joint. In the lano occipital joint, we're going to be able to feel the wings of his atlas very easily right here. In this older horse, it's very easy. In a great big draft horse, it's somewhat more difficult. But we have the wings of the atlas right here, and they're huge. You can palpate them quite easily. And what you want to do is you want to get this horse straight, reach up underneath, and evaluate the relative distance from the lano-occipital bone, which is protruding right here very extensively in this horse, to the occiput and the jaw bone. And you want to make sure on both sides that it's symmetrical. In this case, the one on the right side is elevated, the one on the left side is down, and it's, and it's moved posterior. We're going to direct ourselves to that here in a minute. And then we're going to want to come down the length of the animal's neck. We're palpating for the lateral spinous process. Now, there's absolutely no way that you're going to be able to get into this horse's dorsal spinous processes by using any kind of manual technique or adjusting technique using a device. However, because the neutral ligament and the round ligament, I'm sorry, and the yellow ligament of the back and the supraspinous and infraspinous um, uh, sinuses basically will not allow that to occur. They're, they're down to about here, and you're never going to be able to get through this interior tissue. So the way that you can put a motion into the cervical vertebra of the horse is to do it through the lateral, lateral processes, and you're going to have to palpate for those. Now, the lateral process, here's the, here's the wing of the atlas, and as you come down, you will feel the lateral process of C2 right here. Lateral process of 3 is here. Four here, five here, six at this point here. Okay, where six is the last one that you're going to be able to palpate. Now this is the problem with the horse is you can't get after the C7 and C8 levels because you just can't get into them. They're too far in there. They're too deep. So the way that we're going to make that adjustment, if in fact we find that that's a problem, is we're going to make it manually using the techniques that are used by the American Veterinary Chiropractic Association and also taught by my affiliate, Dr. Dan Kame, and these manual adjusting techniques are the way that we will, in fact, adjust C6, I'm sorry, C7 and C8. However, what we'll want to do is to evaluate the rest of the horse. And as we're doing that, we're going to use the activator device, and we're going to use it over the dorsal spinous processes of this horse's vertebral segment from T2 on back. Now, as you can see, this horse basically has a lot of re re reactive responsive, uh, responsiveness or fasciculation in the thoracic vertebra, especially starting from T2. Now, the first one that you can palpate in the horse is T2. It's right here. T1 is right here, but it's actually down about this far, and you can't get to it. So you can't get to T1. Notice that we can fire the withers off, this wither, wither fasciculation just with our fingers, basically. This, dog, this horse has some problems or issues in the front legs associated in the thoracic cavity. I'm sorry, in the thoracic vertebra. And this is the area here. We'll also go down through this area and we'll, as you can see, that we can, in just touching this horse, fire off a T5. Also, we're hearing serious amounts of borborygma, so you got the farts, you crazy horse. Okay, and as we go down here, we'll fire these off. As you can see, you can do this with your finger. Okay. And then as we move back, we get to about T18, which is right about here. You can feel the last rib, and we go L4, L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. And then we get up to where we call the, what's called the posterior superior iliac spine. The posterior superior iliac spine is to be found right here. Here's the left side, here's the right side, here's the sacrum right in the middle. They're that far apart. They're only that far apart. And they become difficult to find in a lot of horses, especially horses that are well muscled. As I mentioned before, our horse here is down in the croup on the left side. That means that this horse is compromised on the left rear leg. That left rear leg being compromised um, for a long period of time. Now, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and apply an adjustment based on, on this approach and see what it is that we can find. We'll probably stop the... the Ready, Wayne? Yep. Ready? All right. So now, 
One of the things that we're able to always teach you is that you never want to adjust the horse from the side I'm adjusting this horse, okay? You want to be on the other side, but for the sake of, of de uh, demonstrating, we're going to show you how to go ahead and adjust it. We're going to go ahead and put a motion into the left sacra I'm sorry, the left atlanto-occipital area on this side. Now, you can easily palpate this horse from this side. And then we will do it on the other side. We'll reach underneath and do it on the other side. We'll show you what that looks like. And then we'll come down the lateral spinous processes of the vertebra into this area. But before we do that, we want to evaluate how much neck flexion this horse has. And that's the way that we will evaluate C4 